Okay. Um, about five years ago, I was working as an intern for a, uh, an engineering company that does accident reconstruction. Uh, but in addition to that, the company president, Dr. Packer, was very interested in interns. He had a completely ridiculous number of interns for the size of his company and liked to encourage the interns to explore um, new things, learn new things, even if it wasn't really benefiting the company directly. So, the second day of work, one of the other interns, in order to fill an awkward silence with Dr. Packer, mentioned a project that he was working on uh, in his free time for a club at the University of Michigan, which was a large, um, high-powered two-stage project. And Dr. Packer latched on that and said, that sounds like fun, um, why don't I pay you to work on it? <laughs> which is good. And then, um, as the only other intern working there who was an aerospace engineering student, I was asked if I would like to participate, which, of course, had only one answer. So, what we have here is kind of a presentation, kind of a presentation that we gave um, about, part of, about halfway through the project that summer uh, in an attempt to justify our funding by the company. So, I'm just I'm going to go through a portion of this presentation because it just kind of covers some of the goals and some of the specs of the rocket, and then I'm just going to go through a bunch of pictures from construction and launch. Um, so if you have any questions, just butt in. That's fine. Um, one of one of the things that was encouraged once Dr. Packer was funding us was to um, scale the project up a little bit. So we went from a two-stage rocket to a three-stage rocket and decided that our goal was actually to get the world altitude record. People who are funding it, uh, presumably they were hoping to get something out of it. Not really. No? That was, that was a remarkable thing about working for this company. Gosh, I wish I could work for a company like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes. But it did wake up <laughs> Yeah, it woke up better than it normally does, but uh, I fear a restart is in our future. <laughs> so how long did you end up working on it? We spent, there were two of us working on this project, um, with occasional help from a third, and we spent pretty much our entire summer working on it, and then each of us took bits and pieces of it back to school with us in the fall. Uh, so all told, I'd say each of us worked probably four months fairly hard on this. Um, as you'll see when we get a little further into it, this is not an insubstantial project. So so was this a lot of uh, design work up front and then the applications? Uh, we, we were treating it as an opportunity, an opportunity you don't get very often in school, which is an opportunity to follow a project all the way from inception to completion. So we designed the rocket. Um, figured out how we were going to build it, did all of the construction, fine-tuning, tweaking, and then went out and launched it. As I've already mentioned a little bit, um, we wanted to make a fully, fully reusable three-stage rocket. Um, and because we had to justify our expenditures a little bit, we decided to carry a 1.5 pound scientific payload, and our goal was to hit 65,000 feet. Now, the purpose of 65,000 feet was that it would have gotten us a world altitude record for a rocket of this class. Um, when you're dealing with all the different sizes of rocket, you can have multiple stages. The best way to compare them is to measure total impulse from the engine. Um, and I don't remember, like I said, this has been five years ago, I don't remember the exact specifics. I think they're in here somewhere. Um, but anyway, our payload, after quite a bit of discussion, um, we looked at spectrometers, we looked at temperature recording devices, we looked at um, GPS, which is interesting but not very workable in rockets because of some limitations placed on it by the military. Too fast. Too fast. Too many Gs. Isn't there a current competition? That's so you can't use it on rockets. <laughs> Altitude isn't such an issue with the GPS. Um, it's that hard-coded into every GPS device is kind of an override, and if it accelerates too fast or reaches a certain speed, it just shuts off. Well, that's so, so you can't use it on a rocket. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you can't do exactly what we wanted to do with it. 
Um, more specifically, a rocket targeting device. Yeah, you right. just use the inertial dampeners. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, rocket this size, which I haven't mentioned the size yet, so I'm getting ahead of myself. But um, one of the learning opportunities here was composite structures. Uh, this was the first work I ever did with composites, so I learned a great deal doing it. Um, the rocket was mostly carbon fiber, but there was quite a bit of fiberglass in there as well. And I'll go over that a little bit more in detail. Um, so here we have the specs of our rocket. You see the three stages there. Final weight. Uh, these I don't. These aren't the exact values. These are our goals. We came very very close to these to the point that I don't know where we deferred. Basically, we weighed 80 pounds, which is almost 20 feet tall. Um, maximum speed of well over Mach 2. And I think it was supposed to accelerate at about 100 G for the first portion of the launch. 70 second long flight um, was supposed to. I, I'm going to use phrases like that a little bit here. I hope it doesn't spoil the ending for anybody. So anyway, this is kind of what the flight was supposed to look like. Um, all three stages of the rocket launch. After about 5,000 feet, the booster stage drops off on its own parachute. Second and third stage go up to about 15,000 feet, uh, separate and fall uh, most of the distance back to the ground on a small drogue parachute uh, before deploying a bigger parachute. If it deployed the large parachute at altitude, it would have gone probably, I think we figured 20 miles was pretty easy for the third stage. Wow. Uh, which we didn't want to recover. How do you control the height that it deployed the electronics? Many, many frustrating electronics. <laughs> uh, and then the, the third stage was very similar. It went up to 65,000 feet and um, deployed its small parachute to bring it back most of the way to ground. Uh, and then the, the whole flight, I said it was 70 seconds. 70 seconds would be the time under power. It was actually going to be about a 15 minute flight. Uh, and then the rocket motors that we're using were commercially produced. And there's lots of information about them here that you can't read. If anybody's actually interested in that, ask me after I'm done talking. Um, but that's that's one of those motors on a test stand. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a sense of the size and power we're looking at. Um, inside the motors, the motors are reusable aluminum housing. And then there's a stack of these fuel grains, which are ammonium perchlorate and powdered aluminum, plus some things to hold them together. Uh, and then at the end is an ablated nozzle. It's a it's pure carbon nozzle, which withstands the heat fairly well. And is that um, that's actually built into the fuel frame? No, the nozzle is a separate piece. Okay. Uh, which um, I could talk for a long time on the nozzle. I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thrust versus time as long as we can see it. So this is what we came up with for our payload. Um, found the smallest camera we could get our hands on, which was a Canon Elf, and it just barely fit in the third stage. Um, I think that was a two-inch diameter tube, so we kind of had our work cut out for us to get it in there. We got lucky as much as anything. And this is what we hope to achieve with that. <laughs> Exactly. How are you triggering the camera? The camera, I will I'll get to that a little bit more in a minute here. The camera was um, hooked to its manometer. No, I, well, yes, it was. It was a. A circuit made for a similar purpose that was activated by an accelerometer and then triggered the camera at regular intervals. Um, I used a relay for that, which turned out to be a bad decision. We'll get back to that. <laughs> <laughs> there were many bad decisions. There were also it was a, it was a fun experience, but it didn't work great. Um, is this your first try with any type of rocket? Big, it was my first try with any rocket bigger than yeah. hobby shop rockets. Yes. Uh, so. Although the friend I was working with 
had done several before, so some of these were perhaps less excusable for him. <laughs> anyway, uh, separating the stages, we actually we ended up using, getting ahead of myself again, electronics trigger everything in this. Um, nothing is on fuses like the smaller rockets. Everything is activated at launch by accelerometers, and then you have to know your staging very well because you actually have a programmed delay a precise number of seconds before, for example, parachutes open. Uh, and if that happens at an inopportune moment, then things will go badly. Um, but at the altitude, the, the typical way to do this is to ignite small black powder charges. But at the altitudes we were going to, we really don't get much power from black powder. There just isn't enough oxygen to burn it well. So we used a very small black powder charge to puncture a CO2 cylinder to pressurize the rocket tube. And um, there are commercially produced parts to do that, which is great because that would have taken us a long time to make. This is the rocket motor tube, uh, which I've got better pictures of later. And then some more of the fuel grains had these same pictures up. Here's what some of our electronics were looking like. Um, everything inside this rocket was CNC cut, and we had 15 or 20 9 volt batteries scattered throughout the thing to minimize our wiring. <laughs> Which was fine, except that you really can't fly the batteries more than once. So if you want to do two flights, you have a lot of batteries to change, and they're not very convenient. Um, but anyway, each, each section of the rocket had a couple of these electronics bays that just slid right into the rocket tube. Uh, here's our camera again. That's the circuit that we were using to trigger it. Um, not a whole lot to say about that. It's a fairly simple circuit. At what altitude is it pressurized? The rock. The, uh, the pressurization was for separating the stages. Oh. And it was about 5,000 and about 15,000 feet, I think, um, where the first and second stages respectively broke away from the rocket. So this is our camera. The great thing about being funded by somebody else is that you don't mind going out and buying a brand new camera to take part. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And soldering the wires all over it, voiding the warranty horribly. I love those cameras too. Voiding the warranty coolly. Coolly, yes, right. quite. Um, okay, so now we're getting into more of the construction of the rocket. We had access to a CNC, so we used it as much as possible. Um, here we have a sheet of carbon fiber strapped down to the bed of the CNC being prepared to turn into fins, which look like this. There was, even getting to this point, was a huge amount of design because the fin shape is um, fairly critical and a lot of thought went into the design. But was the budget for this? Budget for this? We didn't have one. Exactly. <laughs> what was the end of cost? The end, I think we probably ended up spending around 15 grand. So I was, I was very lucky to be able to work on this thing. How, how did you um, pick fin shapes? Was that a modeling simulation? We, kind of thing? We, did, we did some simple modeling. Um, it was also kind of rules of thumb, cheating a little bit, uh, because we had so much work to do in such a small amount of time. But, some of the things were, you know, a lot of times you see rockets with fins that are swept back from the tube, but that leaves exposed tips that are both sharp and fragile, so we try to avoid those. They have to have a certain amount of sweep so it stays out of the shockwave from the rocket body. Um, the way we designed them has that really long root, which gives us a great place to attach it very securely. And then, this was more playing with the CNC. Um, this is one of the hardest parts, anybody who's built a hobby store model rocket knows this, aligning the fins properly. And it's a lot more important when you're going as fast as we were. So back to the CNC, we cut ourselves an alignment jig out of half-inch acrylic. And basically that just holds the fins in place for gluing. Are it was, the outside of the fuselage, or is it? No, they're, they're, just, they're just attached to the outside, um, but they're, they're secured pretty well once we get a little bit further in. No pins. No pins. Is there a reason that you use like glue instead of like a T-spot? Yes, because one of our goals was an altitude record, we wanted the rocket to be as sleek as possible. So anything that, anything that protruded into the tube meant that the tube had to be bigger than the motor, which it wasn't. 
So there wasn't any place for that. All right, it would have been, it would have helped in a couple of places, but we managed to make this pretty secure anyway. Did the fins survive the landing? Yes, we did not break any fins. <laughs> because of this step, um, we cut out sheets of carbon fiber to lay across all of the fins. The fins are five layers. Uh, I don't remember the specifics of the cloth. The, the fins are five layers thick, and then they've got a five layer sandwich around the tube on each side. Uh, and then cured by a heat lamp, and the result was this ridiculously solid thing. I think you could have used it as a baseball bat without any real issue. Uh, and now I'm, I'm getting into some of the more unconventional stuff. Um, everybody who builds with a rocket has to do everything that I've talked about so far. But because we had kind of weird sizes going on, we ended up making our own carbon fiber tubes as well, which is a huge pain. I'm never going to do it again. Never <laughs> said <laughs> Is that what you were gluing the fins onto? No. Um, the fins, the, the stage light that we were working with, the fins earlier there was a commercially produced filament wound fiberglass tube. Uh, which is really easy to work with. They're very tightly tolerant, so they're fairly strong. I think we ended up wrapping that one in carbon fiber as well, the whole two, just for fun. But and so why was the uh, why was it necessary to make your own tube rather than more? Of that? We had to make our own tube for I think this was for the third stage because we were going smaller than anybody produced tubes at a reasonable cost. I'm sure somebody somewhere made the things, but they would have been more expensive than all of the time and effort we put into doing this. Um, so we experimented with this a little bit and had some failures and ultimately ended up using a collapsible mold which was a cardboard tube with a piece of masonite in it replacing part of the wall of the tube. So once you were done molding your composite you just slid the masonite out and the tube collapsed and pulled out. It took us a long time to come up with that and it would have saved us considerable effort if we'd done so sooner. And uh, then we wrapped it with these, which are kind of like Chinese finger traps made of carbon fiber and fiberglass. They're, they're commercially produced knit tubes that tighten down very easily. This... Yeah, um, it is... I don't know about... Basically. When you pull on it, it gets skinny. Yes, pull on it, it gets skinny. Um, this is kind of out of order because I shouldn't have talked about this earlier. This was one of the situations where we produced our own tube and had a, a bunch of trouble with it. Because we were trying to keep the diameter of the rocket down as small as possible, the transition between stages one and two had some wiring that had to go through for all of the staging electronics, and it couldn't fit in the rocket tubes, so it had to go around the outside. So we, we made a channel for these wires to go through, which you can just barely see here. This is actually our mold, but the uh, the rocket looked very similar to that. Uh, and just these little conduits for, for wires to run through, but that means you can't use a tube. You've got to have the, the, um, the coupler had to slip around the outside of this, so it had to follow that curve. So we made this mold, and back to the composites, wrapped it in, fiber, or wrapped it in carbon fiber, and then vacuum bagged it. Vacuum bagging was a lot of fun. I could talk for a long time on that. Um, I, need to, I need to build a vacuum pump, and then I will. That'll be fun. But vacuum bag that, let it cure overnight, and after another two weeks of trying to get it out of the mold, it looked like this. And um, so then we made some spacers uh, to fit it into the next into the size tube used for the first stage, and you can see here it fit perfectly onto the second stage. Now this is what we ended up with. Um, here's the camera bay at the nose of the rocket, and um, we actually got a professional paint job on it. We, no, nobody involved in the project is quite this good at painting, unfortunately. Um, do you have more pictures of making the tubes? I do, but I don't know that I have them with me. Can you talk a little bit about how that when? I mean, you, so you put the you put the sock thing on the form, right? Right. And then you paint it with your your uh, resin. Mm -hmm. um, and then does it just sit there, or do you have to rotate it? Um, what we ended up doing for that actually was is that vacuum bag. 
No, we, we couldn't. We wanted the vacuum bag. It would have been uh, it would have been easier. But the problem that we would have had would be sucking epoxy places that it shouldn't be, like that piece of masonite that was supposed to come out. Right. right. So what we ended up doing after we after we wrapped the composite around the, the mold was um, wrapped it in mylar tape and then shrunk it with heat to compress it. Mm -hmm. And then you have to peel all that back off again. It comes off fairly easily, actually. That may have been a we got lucky more than we planned it well, but it worked. And then what's the surface finish like when you strip it all off? The surface finish... Um, is, is that something that required a lot of preparation, or was it...? Actually, it was not too bad. Um, I don't know how much work went into it before painting, because I was not involved in the painting. But... It looks pretty shiny in the pictures. It looks very professional. Um, because of the way that was done, the inside surface was very smooth and shiny. The outside surface actually had a basically a layer of it's not cotton, but it's it's kind of fluffy, spongy fiber that helps distribute the resin. Um, so that leaves kind of a rough finish. But uh, so there was there was finished work. There, there was there was quite a bit of sanding when we were done. And, and how thick was the wall on that? The what walls thing? of the tubes that we made were about eighth of an inch thick. Hmm. Uh, it looks like it's very very tall and thick. It is. Um, how tall did that? <laughs> you said about twenty feet. It was supposed to be nineteen and a half. I think it came up closer to twenty. Uh, were there any challenges with making it? Uh, Not do this. Yeah, it, I mean, it seems like it's kind of, kind of difficult to get it to go straight. We'll come back to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I presume we didn't have any active guidance or anything. No, active guidance is a no-no in these things. Um, people in black SUVs talk to you if you have active guidance on your rockets. Uh -huh. <laughs> so not even if it's just go straight up, sure. Yeah, yeah. Is that a learned mistake? <laughs> well, not by me. I don't know. <laughs> so where where was this launching? Um, that's actually the picture that I just had up. As soon as I get it back, I'll talk about it. What? Uh, how, how do you? I mean, put it in a trailer. How do you transport it? We actually built a crate for it and shipped it because we had to go to Nevada to launch it. Okay. It's very hard to find a place that the FAA will let you launch a rocket at 70,000 feet. So, do they actually come looking for you if you? No, unless you cause an incident. Right. Like in there. And then you make sure somebody else's name is on it, right? <laughs> yeah, turn to address on your phone. I noticed the, uh, uh, the NASA logo on it. Well, it was actually NASA, 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 which is the oh, oh. Uh, University of Michigan okay. Rocket Club's logo. Okay, so uh, the reason that I, yeah, you know, the reason that jumped out at me was that I attended a workshop several years ago on uh, grant uh, applying for grants, and it seems that uh, NASA is huge at grant. At uh, you know, they have they have a huge fund, or at least they did several years ago. A huge fund that uh, they they put out for education, mostly in mathematics, science, especially or not. And uh, I don't know if I still have the book. No, no, I gave it to a coworker. <laughs> Had we known about it at the time, that sounds like something we probably would have looked into. Um, but obviously, the I'm not sure how NASA's funding yeah, is I, now. I have no idea how it would be now. Yeah. Some smaller. Yeah. Probably smaller. Yes. 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 Um, and the setting of speed records, and once a year, rocketry. Uh, the launch is called Balls, and we went to the 16th annual Balls event. The interesting thing about Balls is that it's it's not just amateur rocketry, but it's actually pretty much dedicated to homemade engines. Um, so, for well, by people who don't hear you, 
Well, my people kind of know what they're doing. <laughs> For a week, the middle of Black Rock Desert starts to look like this. Everybody has campers. Uh, some people have tents. They were unlucky. There were some sandstorms. Well, eh, dust, not dust not storms. Bad. There's not really any sand. It's just dirt. But it's an alkaline desert, so it's, yeah. it's very chalky. Kind of annoying. It's, it's, <laughs> it's pretty miserable, actually. Um, <laughs> that was fun. But one of the great things about going to a, a launch like this, and I'd love to do it again sometime without a rocket of my own, is just watching all of the horrible failures. <laughs> this one, you probably can't see this very well from back there, but that's, that's a little blue rocket about, a lawn dart? about six feet tall. <laughs> And it's pointed into the ground, and it sat there for about three hours because nobody could get out there to retrieve it. <laughs> Other times they do that. These are all pieces of rocket. Same um, rocket. Different rocket. That one. That, was, that usually happens on launch. That was yeah. Same pieces of one rocket. Yes, yeah, same pieces of one rocket. Exactly. Um, that's what happens when you make your own motors. Sometimes they work great, and sometimes they do not. And that. And either way, it's awesome. It's, yeah. 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 It's, it's either great way, because it's worth the effort. <laughs> we, we hadn't quite finished our rocket when we got here, so we spent the first oh, 18 hours of our visit dealing with this stack of electronics, getting it into our rocket, getting the batteries installed, getting and ready to fly. that's fuck if so one of you slept. Uh, no, I don't think anybody slept there. There were too many electronics. <laughs> Someone had to sleep on the floor then. But it was great because we were sitting there with a generator powered soldering iron, punched over, working. I might even have a picture of that, just like that. And every 15 or 20 minutes, something would explode outside. <laughs> Yeah. I wish I could blame it on that. It's the kind of work environment that nobody outside of military personnel really gets to appreciate. <laughs> but we spent a great deal of time packing the recovery system. Uh, I think we're still packing the recovery system. That's the motor, first stage motor. Pretty sizable, very heavy. Slept next to a motor. Yes. Uh, it didn't really matter, though, that we were doing all of this work because for the second half of that day, that was the view outside. <laughs> yeah. Sandstorm. It cuts down on the explosions. Uh, yes, it did cut down on the explosions. Yes. Nobody yeah, was Two are lovely tattooing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but at night when you look up, you still see the stars. <laughs> Once it cleared, some people who were tired of blowing the rockets up decided to blow other things up. I <laughs> think this is a bowling ball cannon, but I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I know I want one. But yes. <laughs> yes. And uh, this is another problem that we ran into. This is one of the fuel grains. It looks almost exactly like the pictures I showed you earlier, except for the minor detail of this one having a crack running right down there and right down there. This is really bad. Yes, because the way these things are set up, um, the fuel isn't terribly flammable when it's not under pressure. It does burn, but it burns about like wood. It's when it's under pressure that it gets exciting. And for the first part of the burn, you've got a very small surface area that's burning and a very small nozzle holding the pressure in. But as I said earlier, the nozzle is ablative. The opening of the nozzle gets bigger throughout the flight as the surface area, as this burns out, the surface area increases. The pressure doesn't go anywhere because there's more of an escape for the larger burn. But when you've got a crack like this, you get a huge burning surface area right away. And the motors aren't able to take that which takes us a couple of pictures back to the pieces of rocket everywhere. So we discovered this problem having arrived at the launch site, just about ready to fire up a rocket. That's about $300 worth of fuel right there, and we didn't have any more. So we scurried around for a couple more hours, and ultimately we did manage to get some replacement grains. But this is what you do with those broken grains. This isn't ours. This is another gentleman who had a uh, slightly larger cracked fuel grain. You carry it to the campfire. And you sit it in the campfire, pointing up. And it takes about five minutes to get going like this, because, like I said, it doesn't burn very well without pressure. So it takes a while to get burning fast enough to keep pressure without a nozzle on it. But eventually, you get a six-foot-tall jet of bright white flame. <laughs> so finally, we got our rocket together. Um, and then we had to find a launch pad. We didn't bring one, because we flew and we shipped our rocket. And that's apparently not a wise thing to do because it took the better part of another day to get us on the launch pad. Finally, we got time on a launch pad, loaded the rocket up, drove a mile away to the flight line for rockets of this size, and started assembling it all over again on the launch rail. Launch rail tips up, and finally, 
We're almost ready to fly. Um, this is me climbing up the top of that thing, arming the electronics, uh, because like I said, they're all on accelerometers, so they have to be off while you're moving the rocket around getting it into position. And you've got to climb up there, turn them on, and also pull out the bubble wrap that was preventing the rocket from smashing into the launch rod. But working your way down, the last thing you do is put the igniter in the motor. Uh, it's very, very safe until this happens, and then it becomes very, very not safe. So there's only one guy there, and he's done it before. So here is our launch. Um, probably you can't see it very well. I can show you this picture on my laptop directly after I'm done. But basically, we've got rocket here and fire there, and that is not nearly enough fire. So when a rocket did this, that should be a straight line, by the way, that's the smoke trail from the rocket. When our rocket did this, we decided that the motor hadn't ignited properly and hadn't gotten up to speed quickly enough for the fins to stabilize it. And that was our problem. So we spent another 24 hours prepping it for another flight. This is more what they're supposed to look like in terms of quantity of fire. And for the second launch, I seem to have misplaced my pictures of it, for the second launch, ours did that. Uh, unfortunately, it behaved exactly the same. I Dave, you were the one who mentioned the thickness yeah. of the rocket, aspect ratio of the rocket. Mm -hmm. uh, as it turns out, a rocket that is three and a half inches in diameter at its thickest point and 20 feet tall is slightly wobbly. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't work very well. Could you see it wobble? You could not see it wobble. How um, big were the, if, sorry, how big were the pieces that was connected with, like inside the other two? The uh, overlaps were about five or six inches deep. And you could actually pick the rocket up by the first stage with the second and third stages hanging off of it. And you could see some flex in it. Um, the tip probably deflected about an inch. And we were aware of the issue and hoped really hard that it wasn't going to cause a problem. <laughs> right. that, was, that was the idea and it didn't happen quite like that. Um, but anyway, after the second flight, these are some pictures of us going out in the desert and recovering the pieces. One great thing about your rocket going horribly wrong is that they're much easier to find. <laughs> <laughs> because they don't go this far. They only went about half a mile. Uh, unfortunately, the rocket didn't completely survive this second flight. The first and third stages survived fine. The first stage was that filament wand fiberglass tube that we had then wrapped in fiberglass. And the third stage, or wrapped in carbon fiber, I'm sorry. And then the third stage was our custom carbon fiber tube. And neither of those were destroyed in any way. They, uh, they probably have flown again since then, actually. My friend took them and I think built them into another rocket. But the second stage didn't have any carbon fiber on it, and it broke. Um, it actually, the, the fins pulled away. That is, you'll note, the fins still solidly attached to the wall of the tube. It's the wall of the tube that isn't attached to anything anymore. <laughs> That was disappointing, but not as disappointing as getting the camera out. Um, that camera that I spent $200 of somebody else's money on and then disassembled <laughs> took four pictures between the two flights combined, and this was the best one. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the problem? Well, I think the problem was, as I said earlier, I used a relay to trigger the camera. And the problem with relays is being mechanical devices. They don't apparently like 100 G. So this is, uh, this is the four of us. I'm over here on the end. This is the gentleman who helped me build it. And then two of his club mates from school who were there to help with the launch. And the table that our beers are sitting on is actually a rocket as well. <laughs> it flew slightly better than ours. You're <laughs> nice. Uh, so when yours flew, um, what did it actually do the second time? Actually, the second or the first time, it, it makes little difference. Um, despite our thoughts about the motor not lighting fast enough, uh, both launches went about the same. The rocket lifted off of the pad and probably went up to about 3,000 feet, still looking good, still flying straight. And at that point, you could see the smoke trail start to veer off to one side. And once it got maybe 15 degrees to the side, it just turned into a tumble and basically covered no ground at all and just burned all of its fuel doing loops uh, and but it stayed up there it stayed it, remarkably it stayed up there long enough for the timers on the staging electronics 
to open the parachutes, <laughs> which is why it was only a bit damaged on the second flight. Well, only catastrophically damaged, but not over the entire rocket. <laughs> <laughs> so did the third stage fire after that? Or, or? I don't think it did, which is good financially, because like I said, there's a couple hundred dollars of fuel in each of those things, and we they weren't going to find more. It was safe to launch them again? Yeah, the, the first, I think the second stage actually lit um, on the second flight. Um, but on the first flight, the second and third stages were both completely intact, ready to go again. All we had to do was replace the batteries because they had been on for half an hour. Did the, uh, when you launched, did the stages separate as they were supposed to? They didn't. The stages, yeah. The stage, well, the stages had to separate correctly for the parachutes to work. Right. Um, and like I said, the parachutes worked fine, which is why we got the rocket back for a second flight. So and you said it was the second stage that, that completely failed us? Uh, the rocket design in general is what actually failed us, but the second stage is the one that broke. So could you have taken the third and first stage and made a two-stage rocket? We could have, and that's what I was saying. I think my friend actually ended up doing that. Okay. He, took, he took all three stages back with him um, because he's the one who had shipped it originally. But had you had fuel there, could you have turned it into a no, two-stage rocket? No, we would not have been able to turn it into okay. a two-stage rocket that day because we would have had to form a new highly precise carbon fiber coupler between them. Okay. Because the, I don't remember the exact numbers, but the, the sizes were either three and a half or four inch diameter on the first stage, and then two and a half or three on the third stage, and then two inches on the, the third stage. Um, so making that, basically a big shim to make that adjustment would have been a lot more work than we could do out in the desert. If you had had that coupler already yeah, ready to go, just in case. If we had built a coupler planning ahead, yes, we would have been able to fly the rocket without the second stage. There was, they were completely separate devices. There was nothing that required them to be attached to each other. What, uh, what, what measured your altitude? Um, we had an altimeter. One of that big pile of electronics was, and I don't remember how it worked, um, I think it was just a barometric altimeter. Okay. So in, in terms of going for a record, did somebody independently calibrate or check it or it's just... There, there isn't really an official record keeping body for this. It's, so it's just kind of a hobbyist thing. Okay. So if a bunch of people watch you fly and see that your rocket looked pretty good and you land and your altimeter says you got to 70,000 feet, Pretty much, people are going to accept that. Right. Um, now, this is this is my impression of it. Um, I'm sure somebody on the internet will correct me because <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this has been five years ago, and I was only somewhat involved at the time. Mm -hmm. The friend I was doing doing this with had done quite a few rockets before, and I think since, and he was the one who had the licensing required to own those large motors okay. because they are restricted yeah. about as heavily as firearms. And he would, he would have been able to answer that question, and I can't. But that's my understanding of it. If you had to guess, uh, how fast did it get going? If I had to guess, I'd say we got three or four hundred miles an hour briefly, um, which is nowhere near the seventeen hundred we were aiming for. But is there any uh, <laughs> potential aerodynamic issues that may have been? At those speeds that may have been affected. I think our it was going all right for a while, and then I think our aerodynamics were solid. Um, we spent quite a bit of time looking into shock waves, supersonic transition. We were aware that the rocket was going this fast, and, and we knew how to deal with it. So basically, it's just collateral stability. The, yeah, and it, well, actually, stability. I think we were fairly okay as well. Possibly the fins should have been a little bit bigger on the first stage. The big issue was the flex. I think there are legal issues with that. <laughs> you mean like the little... That, uh, that turns it into a guidance system. <laughs> right. Like, like the little uh, paddle wheel pipe they put on the fins on, um, on the military versions. So the airstream makes it spin to stabilize it. Oh yeah, I think that's um, part of being tube launched for a lot of those. There are some things that you can do. I mean, the fins that we had are completely adequate to stabilize. You really don't need anything more than aerodynamic stability if you design it right. Um, unless you can 
intend to maneuver, which is why I think that's probably a no-no. I take it as smart because it couldn't, couldn't be put in there to guide it. I think people have put smartphones in things like this um, to help recover them. They won't record anything during the flight. Uh, I don't know what the limits on the accelerometers in smartphones are, but I'm guessing they can't record energy. Uh, the GPS obviously is going to shut down. But once those factors have gone away, there's a pretty good chance that we could transmit location. Um, there's no cell reception in Black Rock Desert, so it wouldn't have done us any good in this case. Actually, there is. Well, there wasn't. Oh, five years ago. I don't know about um, There was I'm three years ago. If the GPS shuts down at that, certain that G's, it, does, it, it won't come back on again. I don't know that it actually turns off. I never. One I was never able to experiment with it. I think it just <laughs> doesn't give any yeah. well, Once you're over a certain speed, yeah. 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 it stops responding. Yeah. Yeah. So that you can't use it above certain velocities. Yeah. 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 And if you're both. No, I'm saying it was like one. But at the point where you're too stuck for it. As I recall, we actually spent some time looking into that. We were hoping that something like that would be the case. And the companies that we talked to um, were not confident. Yeah. And it's possible that today you can get something that would do that. Uh, but this has been a while ago, so I don't know. How is uh, vibration on board? Is it pretty smooth or are those? They're not particularly smooth. Um, I mean, it's. I mean, aside aside from the just the main force, how much of a variation in it is there? I've seen videos from these, which is the only way I've gotten an answer to your question. Um, and the flights are reasonably smooth. There is some vibration. It's. Probably not enough to cause problems for any of the electronics. Bearing in mind they're only under power for 70 seconds, uh, it's not really enough time to break anything loose. Your bigger issue is just the overall force. Everything has to be very solid, very secure to begin with, and it may be that that factor of safety in that completely overrides any concern about uh, vibrations. Which way did you orient the relay? Which <laughs> way? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we might be able to find out. The, uh... Did you recover the relay? Because I'm kind of wondering if, like, if it was just dangled in there. Yeah, <laughs> we did recover it, and I don't think we ever tested it. So it <laughs> may have been mangled inside. I don't know. <laughs> I don't see the camera pod on this picture. The camera is still working and everything, though, when you got it back? Yeah, the camera continued to work after this flight, just not during this flight. Hmm. Now, I, I don't have a picture of that with me. I can check when I get home and That'd be ask curious. a question next time I come. I'll probably forget, but you know, that's, that will be my goal. Cool. Any other questions?